Good morning, everybody. Um, it's lovely to be here. I, it doesn't seem so long that I was in your shoes. I was an ESRC-funded PhD student. It was a long time ago. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about myself. I work at the University of Essex. I teach across sociology, history, criminology. Not necessarily because I wanted to do those things, because that's where the jobs were. I started out as an historian, historian of social policy, crime, moved into social policy and criminology from there. So uh, flexibility has always been an important part, I think, of, of certainly what I've done, mostly to survive in the business. Uh, the kind of work I've, I've done has focused on, as I've said, crime, youth crime, um, public policy, labour markets, a real mixture of things, mostly 19th, 20th century. I'm no stranger to DTCs. I set up the Essex DTC when I was uh, Dean of the Graduate School there a few years ago. Um, so it's really amazing, you know, having sat through weeks and weeks and months of working on bids to see DTCs finally set up and students actually coming through the door. So I, I feel that very personally. It's great to see you. I'm now a, a selector for the AHRC on the, um, for a consortium, which is a similar like an AHRC uh, DTC arrangement. So I've got a view across two research councils, which is interesting. But today, what I want to talk about is my experience of, um, I suppose, creating impact through television and unlooked for impact, I have to say. No one was more surprised than I was that, uh, that this came to pass. Uh, but I'll tell you a little bit about that. And it started through really two, uh, two projects which um, have the ESRC stamps all over them. So thank you, ESRC. The first was my PhD, which was about the history of bad girls in Britain. And it was looking at what happened to delinquent, destitute, neglected, wayward girls in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And those, many of those were sent to institutions, rescue homes, children's homes, preventive homes, and so on. And 99% of them were trained to be servants. And uh, I wrote a, a PhD about that and a, a book about that. And that later became, many years later, 20 years later, a, a TV series. But I'll talk a little bit about that. But last year, I um, worked on a, a, a BBC Two documentary on the history of shop workers. This is the, the book that accompanied the, the series. It's now out in, in paperback. If you can get beyond the Mills and Boone cover, what you will find is, is social science impact stories. So it does come in many different packages. I don't know how many other ESRC projects have a, uh, uh, an endorsement from Saga magazine, uh, <laughs> but also The Observer and The Telegraph. So um, uh, it's been an interesting journey doing that. Shop Girls was supported by, uh, uh, similarly, uh, a grant, fairly small grant, £40,000 from the ESRC, and that £40,000 paid for a researcher who sat in the British Library and, and various other archives and libraries and, and worked like crazy uh, to create the, the underpinning data, I suppose, underpinning research for what became the Shop Girls project. So first we wrote the book, and then... Um, last summer, I don't know if any of you have seen this, but last summer uh, this came out as a three-part BBC Two documentary. And this is the one where, where it all started. This was my, the, the book on bad girls, which was directly taken from my PhD. And that, that came out in 2003. And that then became, that was the first series that I did, another three-part series on, on servants for, for the BBC. But, you know, it was all very haphazard and accidental, and if you catch me in a break, I can maybe tell you the, the full story of that. I suppose my route into that, from, from you know, classic monograph to, to book, was really, as a PhD student, I was, before I knew these words, impact and knowledge exchange, where I always thought knowledge exchange was simply talking to people um, and talking to other people outside your, 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 your own field. Um, I was sort of putting a toe in the water with, with media, so as a PhD student, I sent off an unsolicited article to The Guardian, mostly because I was so cross about then Conservative government's policy on youth justice, and I fired off an article, never thinking they would publish it, and they did publish it. Um, but there wasn't a kind of discourse around impact at that point. I think my point is, this is about mindset. If you want to engage with the public, it's nothing to stop you engaging with, with the public, with, with, with the media, you know, because you think it's the right thing to do, because you're really cross about a particular thing, or you, know, you have a commitment to social change. 
change. So I'd like to think about how you tell social science stories on TV. And it's really hard. It's really hard. I think um, other disciplines have the edge here. Um, if you think about, I think, we're, well, let's start with the positive. I think social science has the advantage, obviously, on news and current affairs. And, 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 and within that, particular sub-disciplines have, have an advantage. You know, what do you see on the news, what kinds of stories, and so on. So if you're studying economics, politics, health, criminology, you've got a, a kind of a more immediate route to the big stories of, of the day. But when it comes to things like features and documentaries, the kind of stuff I've been doing, I personally think at the moment social history has the edge. I can't think, when, when do you last see a social scientist on television that you can name as a social science presenter? There are very few, there are very few. That if, they are, if they exist, they exist in the news and current affairs area. And I think one of the reasons for that is about storytelling. And I think um, public engagement for, for big audiences is about storytelling uh, and that the, uh, certainly social history, in my experience, has a kind of an, a, an edge to it there. What they both have in common, though, news, current affairs, and features documentaries, you know, is this, that you, know, you have to connect with the audience. Can't move away from the mic. I really, I really want to move away from the mic, but I can't. Um, you, uh, you, you have to connect with the audience's experience and emotions, whether you're telling a news story or whether you're making a, a history series. There has to be a driving narrative. You've got to have a story to tell. Um, there's got to be light and shade. Uh, there's got to be hope and struggle. Uh, to hold an audience's attention. It can't be unrelentingly grim. I, I was talking to BBC Two commissioners about doing something a bit more uh, sort of social science based. They said, oh, the problem is it's so grim. It's so grim. And people don't want the kind of grittiness out, uh, minute after minute after minute. You need the light and the shade. Uh, and that's a challenge for us, I think, how to tell uh, those stories in a slightly different way. And both of them need you know, clarity, exposition, explanation. So let me think about the kind of social science stories I was able to tell. And I felt really it was, it was like it was the, uh, the series were kind of a Trojan horse for, for, for social science. You, know, you, you get them in on a, on, a, on a promise of watching something like Downton Abbey or something like Mr. Selfridge, and actually underneath it you're bringing in all sorts of uh, rather less savoury facts. So the story we were telling in, in Shop Girls was the story really, and there are several social science stories, I won't go through all of them here, but you know, this photograph really, really says it all. This is an, one of the early groups of staff from Marks and Spencers, um, about 1910. And you can you know, look at, just look at the gender division of labor when we started with the ESRC. Here it's totally the opposite. There's one man in the picture, and he, or two, they're the boss and the security guy, and all the rest of the workers are women. And they are young women, they're, they're, they're school leavers, they're aged 14 to 20-ish. To, to um, so really we were telling the hidden story of those workers. No, we, all, we all knew about the man at the back, we all knew about Mr. Selfridge, but we didn't know about the people on the, on the, on the shop floor. And um, amazingly, very few people had done anything on the history, actually, of shop workers. And it was the same with servants. They're very understudied as a group. But if you take them together, servants and shop workers were the two largest single groups of employees in the country. And it's so interesting that actually academia had ignored them as much as anybody else. So we're looking really at the, at the feminization of, of, of shop work in this series. Shop work used to be a very male uh, sphere in the 18th and early 19th century, it became utterly feminized. That was the big, that was the driving narrative over the three episodes. Now, with feminization of, of, a, of a labor market comes two things, comes opportunities for women, fabulous, also comes uh, entrenched gender and skill gaps, gender pay gaps and skills gaps, and flexible working and all of this. Most of the women in this picture earned far, far less than, than, than any male counterpart in the stores. And they also tended to leave when they got married and then dip back in again as part-time workers later. So you've got this, it's about structures of, of labor markets. But you wouldn't hear me using those words in the series. So the, the terminology we use and the jar, or jargon, whatever, you know, the technical terms we use have to be used very sparingly in these kinds of uh, setups. Just in case uh, you thought this might improve over time, this was 1910. This is a Woolworths store from, uh, from 1960. 
and this is from their own annual report. And up in the top left-hand corner, you've got the, 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 ma the managers <laughs> of a store and the army of women workers uh, behind the scenes. I've actually had that made into a poster, which is in my kitchen, which I, I absolutely love. Um, so they're stories of transformations, uh, a, a feminization of a labor market, and then the, the impacts of that on, on people's lives, real lives, lived lives. Let me tell you a, a couple of other stories um, that we, we, we're structuring these narratives. This is a, a, a still taken from a, a filming day, and I'm standing outside Brent Cross Shopping Centre in North London, if anyone's been there. Um, it's the, Britain's first out-of-town shopping centre, the first, so we were there as a, as a landmark uh, a location. It's all very much location-driven, because another narrative of the story, a social science narrative, was the transformation of retail space from the small family-run business through to the multiples, the early chain stores, through to the first out-of-town spaces and the transformation of urban life and urban living. So you need to be there to tell that story. The reason we're on this side of the road is that Brent Cross would charge us £2,000 to film on the other side of the road. So it had to, it had to be, and budgets are absolutely everything in this, in this game. And, uh, and, and the, the young woman holding the reflector is my daughter who came along for the, for the, for the filming day. And uh, was, she was very, very good. Um, and just uh, the, the woman on the green holding the, the monitor is the director, uh, Jenny Dames, who, um, so it's a small team of five really that go around making, making the, um, the films. But that was really the story of the transformation of retail space. Just to show, it's not all glamour standing outside Brent Cross. This was uh, um, another location and another social science story. This is, this is me on the Mersey Ferry in a, in a, in a howling gale, and I'm trying to reconstruct the journey, the return home journey of a man called Owen Owen, who was a Liverpool uh, store owner, and he went to America in the early 20th century to go and learn from the Americans about, ch about department stores. And he, and he came back on the Mersey, and as he came back down the Mersey, he had this vision for what he was going to do with his store. So this is us trying to recreate the, uh, <laughs> the journey. Um, but again, it's, it's a way of telling the story. Now, I could have stood anywhere and told that story, but you have to be, you know, it was on a ship like this that Owen Owen stood, and as he sailed back in, he thought about this. And this is what I mean about storytelling. And it's not about diluting the facts, it's about presenting them in a palatable and accessible uh, and engaging way. He was actually Welsh, Owen Owen, you might guess from the name, and um, a Liverpool store owner. And locally, he's known as the Welsh Mr. Selfridge, but I don't think that really, <laughs> really, that really took off. But I thought I'd throw that in for, for today. So it's a bigger story. It's about Americanization. It's about Taylorism. It's about labor efficiencies. Uh, it's about systems theories in management. But again, you wouldn't hear me saying those words on screen. They're in the book. They're in the book. They're, they're, they're sort of gently put, uh, you know, eased into the book. But uh, it's not front and center. So basically, you have to learn a new language. You have to learn, you know, you have to relearn, you know, you rephrase your academic writing. So TV, I think, tells stories um, in a very particular way. It's obviously, it's highly visual. Um, it's very sensual. Um, it's empathetic. It invites the audience to think, how do you think Owen Owen felt as he was coming back? Did he think, da -da, did he think this? Now, you may think, well, that's ridiculous. You know, the audience aren't fools. They, they know that. But if you try and do it without that level of engagement, very boring to watch indeed. So in engaging with the, the audience is a very important thing. So. Let me show you a clip from the opening of, of Shop Girls. If I could have the opening titles up, please. Now, what I want you to watch here, there's, there's, there's no narrative here apart from the voiceover. It's the trail for the series. But look at the number of images and look at how we told the story through images in the 30-second trail to entice people to watch. I say we, I had nothing to do with this, but um, th th those that knew did this. Okay. So... Yeah, you have it. I mean, that's, that's, so people have got to decide, having seen that, am I going to watch that or am I going to flip over to what's on the other side? You've got very little time to draw people in. And um, if you know your Ali Hochschild and you know about the managed heart and, the, and, 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 and emotional labour, my, my little reference there to they're the heart of the shops is a reference to that. So it's a lot of double-edged double working here. It's mostly for my benefit. I don't think any of the crew kind of realised what that was. But I said, don't you know Ali Hochschild, you know, the, the managed heart? Surely you've heard of her study of air hostesses. No. <laughs> so there's that. Now, I'd, let me show you another little clip, very short one, of, um, of uh, an interview we did with uh, a group of present day Sainsbury's workers. Because for me, this was the crossover from social history to social science. 
You, you couldn't put it better. There's so many of us, they've got that flexibility. Um, so my point there is contributors, workers, regular people as experts. You don't need a, 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 an academic to be you know, stating the bleeding obvious very often that, that, that there's, you know, other people have voices in here and, and social science history telly needs to work, work with them. Um, the other reason I wanted to show that clip is just to really drive it home that, that the women there are not just the workers in the store, they are the people watching the telly in the evening, and they are the, they are the you know, we talk about public engagement as opposed to policy engagement. There's the public. That's, you know, th th they're your audience. So you, you need to be speaking in ways, you know, that, that can engage with their, their interests, their jobs, their homes, their lives, their concerns, their fears, their anxieties. And I would say this is a very emotionally charged business. I would say social science deals with these very, very emotional issues. It often cuts out the emotion deliberately, methodologically, you know, purposefully. And I was intrigued by Francis's comment that you were embarrassed to have the word family up there on the slide, that it felt a bit, it felt a bit sentimental or something. And I think, I think we've all got to kind of maybe you know, get, get over that. These are emotional stories. It's not about TV putting emotion at the front and center. This is how people you know, live their lives. So I've got five golden rules, I think, for public engagement. First one is to respect the public. Um, Meet them more than halfway, know where they're coming from, know what they're interested in and what they're going to watch or listen to or engage with and what they're not. And, and don't feel that that is dumbing down, that's just communication, that's, that's just normal. And you will need to do this if you're going to become a, you know, a university teacher, you're teaching first years, you're giving open day talks to parents who've never set foot in a university. This is just a, a regular you know, life skill, I think, to have. Respect the public and where they're, they're starting points. Believe, believe, believe in the public value of your research. Don't just see it as, oh, I've got to have impact. God, how can I get some impact? I, I can go and you know, have a knowledge exchange partnership. If you don't believe it, it won't, it won't, it won't work out. If you don't believe it's important and you don't believe the, the research has value, um, it, it will be diluted. Have a strong story to tell, as I've said. Tell it in ways that connect with the public. Curiosity, surprise, shame, shock, sympathy, love. When I did my, um, I had two hours of camera training before we filmed servants, and that was all we had time for. And I was terrified. Uh, and I thought it would be about technicality. I thought, well, it's about how you stand with the, with the camera. And it wasn't at all. It was two hours with a coach from RADA, the, the you know, Dramatic Arts Institute. And he was an actor. And he said, OK, um, this is not about what you want the audience to learn. It's about what you want them to feel. And I said, oh, God, you know, this is going to be awful. You know, I can't, I can't do this. And, he said, well, they won't listen to you. They won't listen to you. It's about what that you want them to feel. And I've, that's just absolutely stayed with me. And, and it, it opened a, a kind of, you know, a, a light for me, really, to, uh, to, to think about you know, what you want people to feel. So when you're doing, say, a piece to camera, it's, well, did you know Owen Owen did this? And do you, want, do you want the audience to feel kind of, oh, intrigued, appalled? It's an emotional response you're looking for. And I think social scientists need to rediscover the emotional response if you're going to have a hope of telling stories to the public. And also to politicians. Polit politics works on emotion. Um, you have to know which buttons to, to press. Keep it simple, but build to complexity. Don't give up on complexity. Those are stepping stones. You don't, you don't give up on complexity, but you have to start simple. I always think of it as a kind of uh, you know, set of stairs. You, can't, you, you guys are PhD students. You're, you're almost at the top of the staircase. You can't get any more educated than you, you guys. You're at the top of the staircase. Your audiences are at the bottom of the staircase, and they need stepping stones. They need uh, you know, simple explanations, as first-year students do. OK, so where to begin? These are my, I've got five, five points to, to finish. Have I got time to do yeah, five things? OK. I, I've got, there are lots of embedded links in these slides, but I think you get access to the slides, so I'm not going to play and open every single link. First thing is to build a profile. Um, and you can start to do that you know, gradually now. You can you know, all have a Twitter account, all have a personal you know, little website for, for your research uh, with keywords telling people what, what you do. My, my husband's a journalist and he said you know, when, he's look, when, he, when he books guests to appear on new, news programs, how does he find them? Well, he Googles you know, uh, immigration or austerity and who's, whose names come up top and first and who's doing the interesting things, uh, uh, that's where he'll go. So if you're not telling people what you're doing, they won't find you. Um, you can, you can um, start sending things off without being asked. So uh, little think pieces, short talks, 
the Guardian comment is free. You know, sometimes it's full of loons, but you know, you, you can you can post a, a Guardian is free comment tomorrow on your research. You know, no one you have to wait to be asked. So basically, don't wait to be asked is my message there. Um, and you can you can practice doing things like that. And there's all sorts of uh, sites there. There's just a selection. I'm not going to go through them now. This is very important, I think. You have to learn to write in a new style. Now, you're just learning to write in a kind of academic style at the moment, you know, first year PhD, first term, and, and thinking about the journal articles and you know, later, you know, further down the line, and your first chapters and that sort of stuff, your research designs. But this kind of public engagement that I'm talking about requires writing in a different style. So therefore, you need to read things in a different style as well. You know, read Danny Dawling's book. Um, read Tim Harford, uh, the undercover economist. You know, he's probably the, the most famous economist in, in Britain, apart from the ones educated in the Uni University of Essex who are now running Greece. Um, the, uh, <laughs> that, there's an impact case study. I don't know if they were funded by the ESRC. I think it was Syriza funded by the ESRC re PhD research. It may have been. Um, things like you know, feminism and it's, it's not because you need to know the content. It's about how you express it. Okay? It's about the idiom and the, and the way that, that you express it. I mean, I could just very, very briefly here, if I read you the opening paragraph of, of Shop Girls, okay, this is the, the, the book, Let me, just to give you a sense of the style. Um, we start with a quote, uh, no, no, in 1900, a quarter of a million women worked in shops. By the mid-1960s, the number was a million, nearly one-fifth of the country's female workforce. Today, women are such familiar figures behind the till, the counter, and in the boardrooms of retail chains, it's hard to imagine shop life without them. Yet, there was a time not long ago when they were rare. This is the story of shop girls and the part they played from the Victorian age through to the present in Britain's retail revolution. So that's the opening paragraph. That's what I mean about the style. You don't carry on with that style the whole way through, but um, that took me ages to learn to write in that way. Um, it, it doesn't come um, necessarily easily, but you can still be accessible. Learn to visualize. I was very intrigued by Danny Dawling's talk yesterday, those of you who were there, when he talked about data visualization and how he started out in that in the 90s. It's the key, absolutely, to this. Um, forget text for a while, for a while. Obviously, you need that for your, for your scholarly outputs, but try and think, you know, how can you tell a story through images, through pictures, and so on? We might just quickly look at the, um, the, uh, the FT one. Can I, how do I get that? Can we have the, just the FT? So Martin Moore, Financial Times correspondent, you know, big economist, and this is how he does his podcasts. I personally find that a bit much, and I find it a bit distracting. I can't concentrate on all the things at once, but, but it's the way the wind is blowing. And if we could just go back to the, um, the main slide, a very quick look at the New York Times, and let me just tell you quickly about that. I think this is absolutely fascinating. Not only is it fascinating, it's beautiful to watch. It's, like it's an art form. It's the way the New York Times are beginning to move to a kind of blended form where you scroll down the screen, and as you scroll up the screen, you move, to, you move to a graphic, to an image, to a bit of film, to a bit of footage. I think this is a, a very interesting format to watch. And I think lots of people could we, could, we could do a lot with this, this kind of format. Sorry, I'm a little bit rushed there. But the, the links are embedded, so you can see. Let's just go back to the main slides. Thank you. <laughs> so learning to visualize is an important point. And my final two. Um, stuff you can begin to do now, you know, build, build up your contacts, make a note of who, who are the special correspondents um, in, in, in the media who specialise in your particular area, who are the economics correspondents, the crime correspondents, the health correspondents, for the different channels and the different news outlets, and keep an eye on what they're doing and, and, and so on. Um, similarly with independent production companies, if you're interested in the TV route, I'll park that for a minute because that's, I know that's a bit more of a niche thing. This, I think, is really interesting. Data release calendars. If you're working on um, you know, unemployment figures or uh, unemployment rates, you need to know when the, the Office of National Statistics are going to release their next tranche of data, so you're ready to comment. And uh, um, they publish release calendars all the time. And Gorkana is a, is a, uh, a commercial um, news alert service which does the same thing. So you can be ahead of the game. Being you know, on the front foot, I think, is very important here, so you're not caught on the, on the back foot. If, however, you're, you, you've got your list of correspondents and you're, you're, you've got a story for them, and they ring you up, be ready to respond. Don't sort of go, oh, God, you know, I'm not ready. I need another week, because it won't work like that. I once... Um, 
called a radio show as a PhD student, which was called Call Nick Ross. Anyone remember Call Nick Ross? Okay, I was one of the people that called Nick Ross. He used to have a debate show. It's a bit like Jeremy Vine, when the public would call in about a particular issue. And I called in about, it was a youth crime thing, my PhD. And another person in the media from another channel thought, oh, that had heard it, got in touch, rang me up and said, oh, it's interesting what you said about that actually youth crime hasn't got worse. Would you like to say a bit more? And I just went, oh, no, um, yes, next week. You know? and, and I lost it. I lost it completely. And I, I, didn't, I didn't follow it up. I, was, I wasn't ready to respond. Um, so beware of that. And the final thing, this is my final slide, is really, this is about you building your audience. And this is year one of your PhD, year two, year three, year four. If we jump to year four, at the end of it, you're going to have a thesis, uh, and, and that's for an audience, a very important audience of two. An 80,000 word thesis, 60,000 word thesis for an audience of two. We all know who the two are, the examiners. But obviously, your PhD has got to be a lot more than that. And, and you can start building up an audience very early on, Twitter feeds, blogs, think pieces, year one, for example, YouTube, year two, you might do an interview about your work and have it on your, on your website. You'd start doing conference papers. Year three, get into the book review market for, 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 the, for the ordinary press as well as journals, media articles. A thesis in year four, you'd want a journal article coming out by then if you want to be an academic. Um, book proposal based on the thesis, and maybe you'd associate yourself with a think tank in some, in some way. It's just an example of how you can actually build an audience over the four years. It's a long game, but uh, I wish you every success with it. So thank you very much. Thank you.